Well, man, what a morning. And I'm just so excited. I love, obviously, we love Phil and that baptistry each and any and every Sunday ever. <laughs> um, it's pretty awesome to see um, these kids come to know Christ and immediately follow him in baptism. I got to spend a little bit of time at camp. Um, man, I'm, I want to say thank you. Obviously, Morgan is incredible. Um, to the people who went with her at camp, to our leaders, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for our teachers, anyone who's invested in the live, lives of kids um, around here. Thank you so much. Um, this, is, this is what we do. We help people find and follow Jesus around here, and, uh, and it's so great to see that we started with a fundraiser for kids, um, and it hasn't ended yet. But to see the fruit of what God has done in eternities changed is pretty awesome, man. What a beautiful, beautiful morning. Um, man, we're going to be in 2 Peter. We're continuing in 2 Peter. We're going to finish chapter 1 today. Um, give you a chance to open to 2 Peter chapter 1. As you open there, I, I got a question for you. I'm wondering, have you guys ever done something awesome, but nobody saw it? You ever been there? You did something incredible and you look around and like there's no witnesses to the great thing that just happened. I, uh, I have, uh, I've done that. I've been there. I, the first time I dunked a basketball, um, no one saw me. And I'm like, no one's going to believe this happened. No one's going to trust this was real. I didn't think anyone would believe me. I'm afraid that's going to happen to me in golf. You see, I've, played, I've been playing golf for 30 years, and I've never hit a hole in one. It's not happened yet. Um, and I'm convinced that the first time it happens, I'm going to be playing alone and that no one will see it. Because I've heard a number of like hole-in-one stories from people where somehow no one was there, no one saw it, but I'm supposed to believe it's real, Right? It's this idea, right? We, we need, we want that eyewitness testimony. It's a big part of our life, isn't it? We actually know eyewitness testimony. It's a big part of our history. It's a big part of our criminal justice system. Because like, have any of you guys thought about, have, why do you believe George Washington existed? How do you know he was real? Right? Like, I never met the guy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even think Larry Legend's that old, right? Like, I, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, I didn't, I'm sorry, Larry, I love you, bro. Um, but we believe George Washington was real, right? I never met the guy. You never met the guy. It turns out, though, there were people who met George Washington. They saw him, they talked to him, and then they wrote about it, right? They wrote it down. And that's helpful. And honestly, I don't know any of the people that wrote about George Washington either. I don't really know how quality of humans they are. But a bunch of people seem to point to the fact that that guy existed. And so, all right, I can believe that. Because that's how we prove something happened in the past, right? Because if you hear something, like if you're like me, if I hear that something happened and I wasn't there for it, I'm initially going to judge like how possible and how likely it is that that thing actually happened, right? And then any doubt I have that that actually took place will need to be met with evidence to convince me it was real, right? So like, if Tim comes and tells me he hit a hole in one, right? I'm gonna have a few questions. I'm gonna start wondering. Now, Tim's good at golf. And so I'm like, all right, that's possible. And I trust the guy. He's a friend of mine. Seems more likely. I, I, I'm more willing to believe him. And then if he comes to me and says, hey, and there are other people there, they saw it too. I'm like, okay, right? Seems willing to believe. Pretty inclined to believe it. Now, if my brother comes and tells me he hit a hole in one, there's going to be a lot more questions because he's not good at golf. He hardly ever plays and he's my brother, which means I've heard him tell a lot of tall tales in my life. I'm much more inclined to not believe him. All right. So if he tells me that happened, I'm going to need like multiple signed eyewitness statements. I'm going to need background checks on those eyewitnesses. I might need to hook him up to a polygraph test. Okay. <laughs> but the thing is, the interesting thing here is, you actually can't prove history the way we think of like the scientific method, right? So I can like prove that a rock will 
sink in a cup of water. Right? That's what the scientific method does. It's really good, right? So I can get the rock and I can hypothesize that this rock will sink in a cup of water and then I can drop the, wa- the rock in water and I can watch it sink and I can replicate that. And that's, what, that's how we prove things. It's really cool. We can do that. We can do that with a lot of things. You don't do that with history, right? That doesn't even make sense that we prove history. We may think, oh man, if we have video of it or audio of it, but these days you can make a video or audio of anything that didn't really happen and make it look real. You see, you don't, you don't prove history, but that doesn't mean that historical events didn't happen. And that doesn't mean that we should deny everything that we can't prove. Because there are many things that have happened that should change us. There are many things that have happened in history that should change the way we live now and in the future, right? Some events in history have drastically changed our lives. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is writing this letter to a group of believers, a group of people, and it seems like these people didn't actually know Jesus, In that I mean, they weren't with Jesus in his earthly ministry. They didn't walk with him as a disciple in his ministry years. They, these people in South Asia that 2 Peter, this letter was written to originally, they, like us, were in a situation, they did not have firsthand accounts of Christ. Right? Now, it's one thing to believe that somebody hit a hole in one. Because that doesn't really matter to my life. It doesn't really change anything. But you see, what Peter is telling these believers is to change everything about their life because of something that happened. He is telling them to do hard things because something happened. And for something like that, you really want to make sure that what you heard happened indeed did happen. Because while we don't prove history, we can verify through many different methods that something did take place. We can confirm history because history does happen. Things do happen that we don't see. That matters. We want to read this morning what Peter writes in this regard of Christ because what he is saying happened and what he is calling these people to do is life-changing. And that's the type of stuff you want to make sure it's real. So if you will, turn with me again to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. And so we're going to be verses 16 through the end of the chapter. And I'm going to invite you that if you can and if you will, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word together. Again, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 16. He has just talked about the seven traits to supplement your faith with, this idea of what it looks like to follow Christ. And he starts here. He says, for we, Peter says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place." Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Mm, Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these words. God, thank you for the truth of what you did for us. Jesus, you left heaven for us. Sinful man, God, I I thank you that not only did you really do this, God, but that you've given us the truth of your testimony of the eyewitnesses that was there, God. You've given us the truth of your scripture to see this written and, and, and upheld through history. God, thank you for the evidence of my faith. God, thank you 
for who you are and what you've done. Lord, I pray this morning that you would change us. You would remind us of truths this morning that should affect our future. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, you can have a seat. So as we were just saying, Peter here, in 2 Peter, the first part of this letter, he has just talked to them about these really hard things they're supposed to do, right? These seven traits that they should diligently pursue, he says. And these things aren't easy things, right? He didn't tell them to do these simple things. He told them, he told them things like, you should truly know and follow the words of Scripture, all of them. You should know every word of Scripture. Has anyone mastered that one yet? Not me. See, I've studied the Bible a lot in my life. I was one of those weird kids that actually read my Bible. <laughs> Grew up in, a, in an incredible family, was in church regularly in small groups and children's ministry, youth group. I spend many hours a week these days. I've vocationally been a pastor for over a decade now and even before then served in leadership in church. I spend many, many, many hours every week of my life reading and intensely, deeply studying the truth. I've done this professionally, like I said, for over a decade. I have a master's degree in theology with an emphasis in biblical Greek. And I am not even the most well-studied person in this room. There are likely some of you who have studied more of the scriptures in your life. People like Pastor Rick, who has certainly surpassed my knowledge and not even he, Dr. Cope himself would proclaim he has mastered this call to knowing the scripture. Then it talks about things like (laughs) self-control. This one's so difficult to overcome our fleshly desires, our urges, our leanings. I am amazed. There are people that are overcoming addictions and I struggle to not say yes when they ask me if I want to supersize my french fries at the drive-thru. I can't even turn food down. There are people that are overcoming real addictions, self-control so hard. It's incredible the people that do these things. That doesn't even touch the idea of like loving like Christ, he tells us to do. Loving not only the people in your life that you love and that you like, the people that you care about, but sacrificially serving the people and loving the people that despise you. So if, if something in the past is supposed to have happened that's causing me to need to do these things, these incredibly difficult things, man, I want to know that really happened. Because you see, Jesus challenges us to live holy lives. Jesus came and he revealed things that they didn't previously understand about sanctified life, the depths of Christ likeness. He shows love and service in a way that we didn't even understand and we didn't realize was necessary. He talks of things like hate and lust instead of just murder and adultery and infidelity. And these Christians in South Asia, they were not there to see when Jesus said these things. They were not there to see when Jesus did what they heard he did. So Peter reminds them that while they may not have been there, he was. He, Peter. Peter, their friend. Peter, their trusted leader. He was there. He was a firsthand testimony of Jesus Christ. He was a witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And not just he, but others like him. At this time, when 2 Peter is being written, the early to mid-60s, the, the apostles were established and known. Right? The churches knew that God had these apostles, these specially set apart and gifted ones who had walked with him. And Peter is saying that, that they can have confidence in the truth of Jesus because he and those others that they trust saw Jesus as the Christ. He's saying, when God literally spoke from the heavens, remember Jesus being baptized by his cousin John? And and in this baptism that God sends a dove and literally speaks from heaven, and he says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. 
God's saying, this isn't just some dude, some good guy, son of God, Messiah, God, me in the flesh. When that happened, there were people there. And then, and then when, when Jesus goes and he prays before the Father, right, and, and, and we see Jesus and, and like there are people that are appearing before him on the mountain, you know, Peter and James and John, they were there. They saw, they heard the voice of God from heaven. Peter says, we were there. This isn't just some story. There are firsthand accounts. I saw it. I heard it with my own eyes, with my own ears. He's saying, not only were we there to give our firsthand testimony of the truth of Jesus, he's saying, I heard God testify the truth of Jesus. I heard the voice of God say this is who he says he is. So this firsthand testimony of the trusted leaders, these trusted leaders who also had their lives change, you see, they lived differently because of that testimony. See, that type of evidence, this is the type of evidence we want when we're called to live in the way they're asking us to live because of something that happened. Why was it worth it to change their lives? Why was it worth it to diligently seek these traits in their lives, to sacrifice, to change, and to do it all in a world that seemed to hate God and the people that followed him? Why was it worth it? Because Jesus is who he says he is. It's actually true. Peter says, hey, friends in Asia, me and my brothers were there. We saw it and we heard it. He said, Peter and James and John, these guys, these people that you know, we were there. So we can know the stories of Christ are true. Because remember, you don't prove history with a scientific method, but you validate history. You validate history with credible sources, with eyewitness testimony, with changed lives, with writings from that time. Right? There is a, there is a method to understanding if, if what happened in history was true. We have that. Just like we have the scientific method to prove some things, we have a, a historical method to see if, if what happened in history and to know and to be able to validate if it really happened. That's a process we have. We do it with everything, right? Like if you went to school, you studied people in history you never met and that no one in your school ever met. And you, and you learned about it as if it was true, Right? I don't know how many of you heard about George Washington and doubted if he was real and questioned the history of our country because that guy didn't exist. You didn't because there's enough evidence in our world that we have studied to believe that people like George Washington and John Adams and these these fathers of our country, we believe that they were real even though we never saw it. We don't even know anyone who did. And and this is a process of, of understanding of of do we have eyewitness accounts of, the, of these events that supposedly happen? Do we have that firsthand testimony of it? Um, do, are those sources trustworthy sources? Did they write things down? And do I have copies of those writings? And then how, how old are the copies I have? Because if somebody wrote it a thousand years ago and the earliest copy I have is a hundred years old, well, what could have changed in the 900 years since it was originally written and then the copy I have, right? Things could have changed. And so these are the things we look at. How many copies do I have? How close they are? Eyewitness testimonies, how trustworthy they are. We have all of that for Jesus, We have all of that, that God came to heaven, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, and rose from the grave. He came back from the life after being killed. We have all of that for Jesus. You see, God doesn't ask you to believe completely blindly, although he could and we should. Even then, we can take off the blindfold because the truth is right in front of us. We have eyewitness testimony of a multitude of historically trustworthy people about Jesus. We have an abundance of writings about him. We have copies upon copies upon copies upon copies of these writings. And we have them all over the generations from the time Jesus came to the time of now. 
We have manuscripts from the first generation of these writings. Guys, think about this for a second, right? Like, you, we've talked about this before. I've talked about it from the stage. I had a speaker come and speak on it in our um, um, Angus Disciple Institute, which is about to start back up our fall semester. I'm really excited about. But you learn things throughout your life about people from history that there is far less evidence they existed than there, we have evidence that Jesus was God and he rose from the grave. Like you learned about, about Caesar and, and these ancient historians and philosophers. And you learned about them in school and believed it to be real. And I think these people really existed. And we have sh- tiny shreds of evidence these people ever existed. Tiny shreds. We'll have like 10 copies of something they supposedly wrote. And, it was, and from when the time they wrote it to the copy we have is like 4,000 years or, or 1,700 years later. We have a few copies and they're way, way separated from the original date. And then we teach that in our schools as like trustworthy evidence that this is real. This is how we teach, this is how we validate history. And this is what we teach in our world. Everyone does it because history did happen. But that's, do you guys realize, so this letter, the, uh, the apostle Peter is writing second Peter, right? It's a second letter he wrote to these people in South Asia and he's writing it in the mid sixties AD, right? This is when this happened. You can look it up if you don't trust me. All right, this is when this happened. It's right before he's about to get killed. Did you know we have a part of the gospel of John from this time that's this old? We have, a, we have a copy of the gospel of John that talks about the deity and work of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus from the like 60s and 70s AD. <laughs> that's unheard of in history. Unheard of. It like doesn't happen. We don't have anything close to this. Like you should doubt Caesar ever existed a thousand times more than you would ever doubt Jesus. Just historically. Because we have, we have thousands of copies of scripture. Copies from generations all the way back. We have a copy of John that Peter could have actually read when he was alive. The apostles from the time of the apostles. That's unheard of. If you look at how we study history, if we look at how we validate history in our country and in our world, any history, history of America, history of the United States, um, history of uh, any country, of, of anything that happened for any time, ancient history all the back to Plato and Socrates and all these people, if you look at how we study history, there is one book that stands so far above every other as the most trustworthy historical accounts. One book that is by far the most reliable book in all of ancient history, and it's the Bible. And it's not even close. It's like embarrassing of the amount of riches we have to trust Scripture. It's unbelievable that God's done that for us. We don't even need that, but God gave it to us. We have that now. And they had that. Then the second Peter is writing to these people, and he's saying, you can trust that Jesus was real. I was there. These aren't just stories. He says, I was there and it changed my life. And they saw it change his life. They see how Peter lives based upon those truths. Man, it's incredible. We see that people in this time, like Peter and others, the other apostles, they literally died for these truths. They died saying, what I saw, I know I saw. What I heard, I know I heard. Jesus is the Messiah. Without a doubt, I know it to be true, so much so that they can kill me for it. And I'll not deny it until even in those days. I've said it before, I'll keep saying it. Just like Peter says here, The Bible is the most trustworthy document in all of ancient history. That's just a fact. And so when you consider these life-changing things that are being asked of you, like Peter does here in this letter, and you wonder if it's really worth it, if this stuff about Jesus is actually true, you can trust that it is. You see, Peter even goes further, though. Peter says, not only can you trust that the words of Scripture are true because of the testimony of trustworthy eyewitness accounts. He says, you can trust them because no prophecy 
ever came from the mind of a man. They're actually from God through man. Peter saying, men, these prophets, these people who have spoken the word of God, what is our Bible? He said, we were the pen. Jesus was the author. He spoke through us. They're literally the words of God through man. See, verses 20 and 21 here in 2 Peter chapter 1, they call us back to verse 16. And Peter's saying, the apostles, we, we aren't just making this stuff up. He's saying there were and there still are a lot of people making a lot of stuff up. They're spewing out things from their mouths as if they're true and they're not. We'll talk more about that next week. But he's saying there's a lot of people saying a lot of stuff that aren't true. But he's saying what we're saying, these aren't cleverly devised myths of man. We were there, we saw it, we heard it, and I can tell you what we are saying is not just our words. These are the words of God through us. (coughs) These are God's words. Peter says, why should you change your life off the words of the Bible? Because they are the words of God. So let this morning again be a beautiful reminder to you that Jesus is God. That he came to earth to take the punishment for your sins, even though you or I didn't deserve it at all. A love, a grace, and a mercy that's unheard of. That Jesus really did die on a cross, and rise from the grave. It actually happened. You have not only the the Holy Spirit can, can confirm that in you, he can work within you. You can trust the words as the words of God. And guys, we have more evidence that Jesus rose from the grave than we have for anything in ancient history. Anything. You see, people can believe Socrates and Plato said stuff because you know what? It doesn't really ask them to change their life. Sure. Anybody like that. He's all, sure, Caesar. Sure, he wrote things and did things and died in a certain way. Okay. You see, it's easy to believe because it doesn't actually, that truth doesn't ask anything of me. But yet, although we have far, far more evidence of Jesus, that truth demands something of me. But I think we need to be reminded that it's Jesus is who he said he was. <clears throat> we need to be reminded that the Bible is truly the words of God. Did you know that Jesus in his life even confirmed that the Bible was the word of God, right? Jesus even talks about the Holy Scriptures as being from God. He used and trusted them because they were his. (laughs) We can have confidence. We can have confidence in them because the writers themselves, as Peter does here, knew that it was God speaking through them. And we can have confidence in these writings that the prophets and the apostles, because they stood the test of historical accuracy. We can have confidence because we see these men stand. You see, it's easy to believe, to spew lies. But then to have those lies tested and to have your life persecuted over those lies, people give in. These men died, many of them, brutal deaths. Unwilling to change their tune. Peter, historically, it seems as if Peter not only was killed for his faith, but potentially even asked to be hung on a cross upside down because he didn't even want to die like Christ. He didn't think he was even worthy of that. So it is possible that this man right here, see Peter, Peter had some doubts, right? We think of Thomas as the doubting one. But Peter, when Jesus gets arrested and, right, and things start changing, he's like, whoa. And then people are like, hey, wait, I know you. You're Peter. You're that guy who walked with Jesus. And he's like, not me. Right? Three times before the rooster crowed, Peter denied and doubted Jesus. And then he saw Jesus die and then come back to life like he said. 
And he remembered the prophets and the prophecies of old. He saw them come true. And from that point on, he's like, there's no way I will ever doubt this again because I know it to be true. To my dying breath, Peter confirmed that what he saw was real. Verse 19 here sums up our response to this truth. It essentially says this, if you look at verse 19 again, it says, pay attention. It says, as to a lamp shining in the darkness. See, in a dark room, if you have a dark room, completely dark, and then somebody shines a lamp in that room, turns a lamp on, lights a lamp. In that room, all of a sudden, there's only one thing worth paying attention to. It's the only way to see, and it's the only thing to see. I think it's clever wordplay. God is so incredible in his writing, of course. He who invented the idea of language and thought. It's clever wordplay here because it references both the word as the light, right? You remember Psalm 119, 105? You remember Psalm 119, 105 where it talks about the word being a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path? So it references that. It also references the morning star, which is rising, which we see both in Numbers 24, 17. In Numbers 24, 17, it talks about the, the, the morning star rising as the coming of, um, out of Jacob, the Messiah. This is a prophecy about Jesus. You see that? It says, behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. Scepter will ride out of Israel. This is a prophecy that out of that line, out of that lineage, that the Messiah would come, who Jesus is. Also, we see in Revelation twenty two sixteen, and this is where the greater truth is revealed. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star where Jesus is speaking to and through the Apostle John, which is the book of Revelation. And Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. And here in verse 19, he references this truth. Jesus is the bright morning star here. The sun that brings the morning. And as he said to John in Revelation, Jesus is going to return one day. See, just as we pay attention to the word of God now, as the lamp shining in a dark room, as the light in our path in the darkness of this world, one day the morning star will rise and come again. One day the star will come that will overwhelm all darkness. The star that is immeasurably greater even than the lamp. Why is it worth it to live out what the Bible says? Because Jesus is coming back and we don't know when. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2 says that the day will come like a thief in the night. We don't know. This, this, this prophecy and this teaching in 1 Thessalonians is saying you don't know when the Savior will come and so live ready at all times. If someone tells you you're going to get robbed one of these nights, then you better stay ready every day and every night. Now, Jesus isn't coming to rob. He's coming to save. But the truth is, we don't know when the day will be. You cannot put off obedience until tomorrow. You can't put off obedience until some future time because you don't know if that day will ever come. Any day, whether by Christ's return or him bringing us home, we're going to sit at the Bema seat where God will look at our lives and reward all faithfulness. <clears throat> this idea of a beam seat's timely as well, because that idea came from like Olympic type games. This idea of the beam seat was the reward seat. That's where do you go to receive your reward for winning in the games. That's what they call the beam seat. And this is where believers go, right? We don't go to be judged by God for eternity, heaven or hell. We don't face that. If you put your faith in Christ, you don't. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we do, we do go and sit at the Bema seat. And in this moment, Jesus is going to look at our life for reward's sake. And he's going to say, have you been faithful? 
And he's going to look at the life and whether you've been faithful and you will be rewarded on that day. Right? You will, you'll face Jesus And you know what? Some of us will have rewards. Some of us won't. It's it's an incredible truth that I have a hard time grasping, but we're going to be rewarded for our faithfulness. And 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 I think when I get to that day, may I not walk away ashamed and empty handed, narrowly avoiding hell as if I'm smelling like smoke walking into heaven. Because I kept putting off faithfulness and obedience. And may I be reminded of the truth that Peter reminds those in South Asia in this letter. That we have all we need for Christian living right here in the word of God. He's given us all. And man, is it hard. (laughs) Guys, it's not easy all the time. But it's worth it. To live our life for Christ. It's worth it today and every day because what, what Christ did for me, what Christ knows of me, he knows what is best for me. He died for me when I was a sinner, when I was his enemy, the word says. He looks out for me and he will reward my faithfulness on the day that I get to see, sit before him. So let this truth, this beautiful truth of the gospel, this beautiful truth of the reliability of our word be a reminder this morning. May it stir our hearts to live for Jesus today because that's what the Bible asks of us. Derek, you and your team want to come back up here? It's a beautiful reminder this morning. (coughs) Powerful. And this is what we need. This is, right, this is why we take communion. This is why we study the word. Sometimes we think that the gospel, the truth of the gospel is just for unbelievers. But we, we need to be reminded of it. Because it changes our life. God asks of us much. <laughs> Everything. And it's worth it. Because if the Bible is true, if Jesus is who he said he was. If Jesus is who this, see this whole book is telling us about Jesus. The Old Testament keeps pointing us to him before we know his name and the New Testament keeps talking about him once we know his name. And if this is true, then it's worthy of every breath from my lungs, every step from my feet, every thought in my mind. It's worthy of everything. And Peter reminds South Asia churches just as God reminds us this morning. It is is true. So we're going to take a moment to respond to this truth. And I don't know what this is. We're going to have some deacons at the doors. Um, we'll probably drop the lights a little bit just to help you make, feel, make you feel a little more comfortable, less um, just worried. We, uh, we're called to respond to God's word and worship. That's what it is. We get to do this. We get to actually respond like right now. And so whatever this is for you this morning, I don't know. But there's a few things I do know. One is faith in Christ for salvation is where it all begins. Right? Second Peter 1 is built upon the idea that you have the faith that saves you. Right? Jesus has saved you through his grace, through his mercy, through his work. This morning it's possible there's somebody watching us online, whatever camera's on, this green light over here. <laughs> there's somebody even, it's possible there's somebody sitting in here with us this morning who hasn't actually put your faith in Jesus, the Son of God, for salvation. And I I don't know, you could have have walked a lot of your life in the buildings like this. You could have spent time in churches, or you could have grown up in them, or you could have served in them, but yet you've not put your faith in Christ. That's the reality that changes you. So let me just remind you again this morning of the truth of Jesus that Peter is calling us to. Because Peter's not just trying to tell them, I saw Jesus do cool stuff, right? That's not what it's about. It's not just like, I saw Jesus heal this dude or say these incredible things. What he's saying is, I saw God become man and die for the sins of us all. And I know it to be true. And here's the truth of the gospel. 
I've had the privilege of sharing the gospel with many people these past few weeks. I've got to go do some of that at camp with Morgan. I've got to do it with some strangers and different people recently. And let me remind you of this. Jesus died for you because you needed it. So the Bible says that we have messed up. We, we call that sin. The Bible says we've messed up. And not, that's just not doing what God wants. And he says, because of that, we're separated from God from eternity. We don't get to know him now. We don't get to spend eternity with him in heaven. And whether you like that punishment or not, it is just because the creator of the universe gave us everything, life, the world around us, the breath in our lungs, and, and then we turn our back on him. And we choose ourself, what the Bible calls our flesh. We choose ourselves over God. And God said that not only does that separate us from God, he says there's nothing you can do to make that go away. That's a stain that you can't clean with good works. But the Bible says God loved you so much, though you were sinful. I was sinful. I was the enemy of God. I was living a life that flew in the face of my creator. And even though I was that person, God loved me so much that he left heaven. The creator. It's actually from what we see in John 1 and some other places, it's possible that when God spoke the universe into being, it was actually Jesus. He might have been the one who did it. God the Son, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hard to understand, but the truth is that God left heaven. He came to earth, he lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross. And not only did he die on the cross, he drank the wrath of God. The punishment from God for all men, he drank that for me. He says, you don't have to get your life right. You don't have to do a bunch of good deeds. You don't have to give a bunch of money or join some church. You don't have to do all that to be saved. You don't have to walk down an aisle or say a magical prayer. Jesus says, I offer you salvation as a gift to any who believe. He says, when you realize that your sin separated you from me and that you need me, when you realize I am who I said I am, and you just say, Jesus, I can't do this. I've I've separated myself from you. I've sinned and I need you to save me. Jesus says, I already did. Here is my gift of salvation. Let me just tell you, if there's any of you here today, I don't care how many times you've been in church or what you've done in your life, if you've not put your faith in Jesus, you put your faith in Jesus like we just saw three of our kids do and get saved. May today be the day you just trust in Jesus. And you just pray and thank him. The prayer is not magical, but you just tell God, I I trust in you. Thank you for saving me. And for those of us who had, you see, I got saved when I was 10 years old. 10 years and seven days. (laughs) November 17th, 1996. For those of us, may we be reminded today that we can't put off obedience any longer because Jesus is who he says he is. The Bible is the word of God. And therefore, we are challenged and obliged to live out the truth. But what a beautiful truth it is because our God is so very good. Will you take a moment? You can pray, talk to God, just yourself, whatever he's working on with you. You can do that right here where you're at. If you want somebody to pray for you or you want somebody to pray with you for something else, come right here to the doors. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. Come alongside you. What a beautiful thing we can do that. But let's respond to the Holy Spirit as we pray over this message.